Welcome to London, the libel capital of the world. £600,000 in damages. Where defending your name can take everything you own. To decide the meaning of these words will have cost £200,000. This is the High Court, where QCs and judges decide who pays and who gets paid. If they said to me, you can have a million pounds, that might be tempting. Some people find what newspapers print or television says unforgivable. Hey, Uri, what's this thing with Michael Jackson? Is it true? Some people will do anything to set the record straight. Worst case scenario is it goes away to trial and I don't sell the house. Where am I going to get 200 grand from in November? So why get yourself into this position? Why take the risk? I want justice and however much I don't want to go to court, I will. So be careful what you say. See you in court may be the most expensive words you'll ever hear. Tonight, what happens if you sue a much bigger and wealthier opponent? The trustees of a London mosque sue a leading conservative think tank over allegations they made that the trust had sold extremist literature. As a Muslim community, we always been attacked. We have to take action against this to, to show the others that you cannot get away anymore with such allegation. But when the case hits a legal technicality, costs for the trustees spiral. They're asking for £453,000, £577. And the organiser of one of the world's most unusual race events sues an American publishing giant over claims his North Pole marathon was unsafe. When running a marathon near the North Pole, be careful where you step. When I saw it, I was actually outraged. But four years of legal battles have left this businessman exhausted. You know, I wish this was over, because it's constantly in the back of your mind, you know, that these allegations are there that you have to defend. This case highlights, more than any other action I've been involved in, the David and Goliath element in this type of litigation. years ago, this was the most notorious mosque in Britain. And when you fight, you kill. Just do it! Anything will help the father do it! If it's killing, do it! Abu Hamza was the Muslim cleric so determined to preach hatred and murder. Finsbury Park Mosque was the power base of Imam Abu Hamza. It had a fearsome reputation as a centre of radical Islam. She urged hatred of Jews and non-Muslims and encouraged people to kill. You help your brothers, you help Islam any way you like it. When police finally raided the building, they found imitation weapons, including a stun gun, knives and military equipment, a gas mask and chemical warfare suits. In 2004, Abu Hamza was ejected from the mosque and later imprisoned for inciting murder. A group of trustees was appointed to rebuild the mosque's tattered reputation. Among them was Mohammed Kozbar. As you can see, this mosque is quite a big mosque. Before we took over in the 2005, 50 people used to come here and uh, worship in the mosque during the Friday prayers. Um, now it is 1,800 people. We have a policy here that we only allow people to come and worship. There is no preachers, no one can come and, and start speaking about any issues except with the authority of the management uh, of the mosque. There is no problem if you hold opinions and views that are different from each other. But the problem is, what does this lead to? But after three years out of the headlines, in October 2007, a report published by the conservative think tank, The Policy Exchange, put this once notorious mosque 
back in the news again. The report claimed that extremist literature was being sold in the mosque. The trustees were so incensed, they instructed lawyer Farouk Bajwa to sue the policy exchange for libel. This is a client of ours. There was five books that were allegedly found in our client's mosque. Stuff like, women will go to hell, women shouldn't be allowed in the workplace. One of them was sort of what we would call very misogynist. The others were generally about how the duty of jihad is very important and to kill people and that sort of thing. They were quite violent and uh, they were quite controversial books. They were not the sort of books our client would want in their premises at all. This is the library we have. It is a private library. But the trustees are adamant no books are sold in the mosque. We don't allow anyone to, to use the library. It's not for public to come and have a look at it. It is only for our own purpose. The trustees are completely determined. They've said to us time and again that if we have to borrow the money, beg, steal, whatever we have to do, we will get the money to fight this case, we'll raise the funds, and we are going to see this through to the end. Irishman Richard Donovan organises one of the world's most extreme running events. Since 2003, he's been taking groups of wealthy and adventurous high flyers to the North Pole to compete in a sub-zero marathon. It is truly a trip of a lifetime. When you look at their faces even, as soon as they disembark the plane, and they're looking at the landscape, and they realise they're at the top of the world, it's all inspiring People describe their life as pre-North Pole and post-North Pole. It's kind of a landmark event. Richard's no stranger to the media. He holds world records as an ultramarathon runner and he frequently features in the press. Here's a distance running, cover story on the race, uh, National Geographic Adventure, GQ magazine, Irish Times magazine supplement, right down to the mainstream runner's world, which is the biggest running magazine in the world. In 2006, Richard gave permission for a journalist to cover the race for Forbes, the business magazine based in New York. Forbes readers were just the sort of well-paid clients he wanted to attract. But the article that he thought would be good for business was not what he expected. If you look at the Forbes magazine article, the article is entitled Run in the Midnight Sun. When running a marathon near the North Pole, be careful where you step. That's telling me straight away, be wary of going to the North Pole. This year's North Pole Marathon got off to a less than auspicious start when the bulldozer crashed through the ice and sank. It just never happened. There's a focus on the plane. Sparsely windowed interior hadn't been cleaned in decades. Seats flattened forward like cheap folding chairs. Luggage piled in back blocked emergency exits. When I saw it, I was actually outraged. It made it appear that I had a reckless disregard for people's safety, that it, perhaps I was on a death wish myself. Libel often comes down to one person's word against another, but not necessarily in this case. OK, so this is video footage of the flight. This footage Richard's discovered, he believes contradicts the article. The article mentioned that the emergency exit was blocked with luggage. I can point it out here. You can see this is the emergency exit. And you can see this emergency exit. It's the only area of the plane where people sit facing each other. And it's impossible to put luggage when wall seats are occupied. The article mentioned that people had to take a sharp right to avoid a lead during the race itself. Now a lead is a break in the ice that exposes the ocean below. It's clear from this video that the, the course is very, very clearly marked. I have flags sometimes 10, 20 metres apart. There is no way that someone could happen upon a lead or any kind of danger like that. 
Richard's worried about the damage of such negative publicity, and he's fighting for his livelihood. From here in Galway, in this far corner of Ireland, he's built a successful business organising races in extreme locations around the globe. In 2004, Richie said, do you want to come to the North Pole? And I said, Jesus, I'd never be able to do it. And he said, no, I guarantee you, you will. I mean, he said that he would make sure that I did it, and he did. And the event was extremely well organised, but I wasn't surprised because that's all Richie does. You know, he spends 11 months of the year preparing for this one event. So I think that really galled him when he read how inaccurate this, this article was. In polar travel, reputation is everything. It's absolutely everything. If you want to go on a polar trip, you want to know the guy who's bringing you there will get you there and will get you back. And so to protect his business and his name, in 2006, Richard decided to sue the mighty Forbes magazine. I'm looking for a retraction, and a very detailed retraction, saying they were completely and utterly wrong. And I'm looking for damages for the financial impact of this as a result of the libel. There's been an interesting development on this case. What we've said to the other side, solicitors, is that we want to see their evidence in terms of the books. We, we've asked them for them, they keep saying no. We want to see all their exact evidence. Okay. Show us exactly what you rely on to prove your case. Okay. Whatever they've got, let's see what they've got. Farouk Bajwa and two of the mosque trustees are meeting to discuss their case against the policy exchange. We've sent them a copy of these statements and mm. we haven't heard anything. So they already got they, they have them. Okay. Since then there's been absolute quiet and we asked them to take the material down from the website yeah. and they wouldn't. Mm. They kept yeah. refusing. We want the court to order them to show us the books. Mm -hmm. We don't know who these researchers are. They have to come to court and give evidence. At this stage, Policy Exchange is not obliged to show their evidence to the claimants. But Farouk has obtained one vital piece of evidence that he thinks bolsters the mosque's claim. This is the receipt. Now, there's a few interesting things about this. This is what the receipt should have looked like, and that's what it does look like. It has the Arabic and the English on the front. The logo has probably been cut and pasted from the website. And the signature is completely illegible. That's not the signature of anyone in the mosque. So we have to have an explanation as to who allegedly signed this. The authenticity of the receipts was the subject of an investigation by Newsnight. Good evening. You may have seen the report in the papers. It made the front pages. Britain's mosques are being subverted by extremist literature. It could hardly have been more damning or more sensitive. Newsnight very nearly joined the coverage. We were working on a detailed film based on the report. But when we were checking evidence underpinning the report, we began to worry. What the BBC did was quite sensibly say that before we publish this report, we'd like to see the evidence that you've got. They had to show the receipts. That's when things became unstuck for the policy exchange. News and I actually got a forensic expert to examine the receipts, and then it became obvious that the receipts were forgeries. It looks to be green, and when we look at it more closely under the microscope, it's actually been made up of blue and yellow dots combining to produce the green coloration. It's been produced on an inkjet printer. Well, Dean Godson, research director of the policy exchange, is with us now. Did you check that these receipts were genuine? Of course. We checked into all. We checked into everything that we did. You've just heard. You still stand by it, do you? One hundred percent. We didn't. The matter. The policy exchange. It's sticking by its story. Is saying that those books were found in that mosque on those dates, which we say is completely impossible. You are claiming that you had evidence that these books had been bought in these mosques. Yes, and they're and not that denied. Evidence is quite clearly, in expert opinion, fabricated. No, we do not accept that 
for one moment. We have the witness evidence of these books. The question is the authenticity of this report, which, as you know, generated a real hornet's nest. What our clients want are answers to find out where these receipts appeared from, why this allegation was made against them. So someone somewhere is lying, and we want the court to decide who's lying. Trying to get an apology from Forbes magazine has been a struggle for Richard Donovan. In July 2006, within a month of the article being published, Richard had decided to try and sue Forbes in its own backyard here in New York, where its sales are highest. A lot of my clients going to the North Pole would have been North Americans, and I was being directly hit by that article in America, and that was going to have the biggest impact on me. And with such a negative article available online, it's still doing him damage. The North Pole Marathon has continued every year in the interim. The numbers are down. Because if I was looking through the internet and I saw an article by Forbes magazine about the North Pole Marathon, I tend to believe it and go, gee, I'm not going to get on that plane. I was turning away people when this article was written. Now the numbers are less. I want the article off the internet without delay. And I remember you know, feeling betrayed when I read the article first right. because of the facts being wrong, but there was also something else to it. Oh, yeah. You know, and I remember talking yeah. about this, the tone, it just didn't match up. Richard's brother, Gerard, lives here in New York and was equally horrified with the content of the article. I think it's a strange article in that way, uh, the way it was written and uh, the, the terminology they used was particularly revealing to me and, uh, and troubling. The term stampeded in reference to the runners constructing an atmosphere of danger, watch where you're going. It just troubled me. Well, they're unapologetic. Richard's attempt over two years to take on Forbes in America has cost him £50,000. He has to pay them $1,500 as a condition of abandoning the action there. But he's not giving up the fight, just where he's fighting from, back home in Ireland. There came a point where literally the, the price became so high because they could put legal obstacle after legal obstacle without getting to the crux of the matter. And that kept my fees going up and up and up, and I don't have a an infinite set of resources, whereas I feel Forbes do. Richard is represented by an Irish libel lawyer whose clients include Liam Neeson and Britney Spears. On uh, Wednesday morning, uh, I did a football. With American clients, Paul Tweed knows why Richard struggled there. Forbes' take has essentially been that in the United States of America, we have got First Amendment protection. Uh, we are free to publish basically what we want to publish. So that's why we have so many Americans coming to the UK and Ireland to take legal action because it's virtually impossible to sue in the US because of their very publisher-friendly libel laws. But having already expended so much on legal fees in America, Richard's options are now limited. The difficulty we have, and we've had from the outset, is that you have a very wealthy international publisher and solely for financial reasons we are in this position where we have got to decide where we're going to prosecute the case. We've got to make a fundamental decision as to whether we continue to prosecute in London, Belfast and Dublin or whether we decide to consolidate and proceed in just one of those jurisdictions. That sounds good to me. Does that combining of these jurisdictions mean there's a potentially less award in the end? No, that's the whole point. That, that's yeah. the, 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 we will be asking that the jury be directed, that they yeah. take into account the distribution mm -hmm. in all three. So in answer to your question, it should not have any impact on an award that you would get in the individual okay. jurisdictions and totaled up. Yeah. Where does the internet fit into this? The fact that... Um, 
Tell article is still up on the internet. Yeah, yeah. I think they have 13 to 15 million unique viewers. We would be arguing, look, there still has to be some onus on these people. This here appeared on the internet. Mm. A magazine like Forbes, it is read by the very people that you are trying mm. to attract. And they told me that experience. from the outset, yeah. when they asked to go yeah. to the poll. Absolutely. It was the first thing they said, you should bring us here. Yeah. Your, our readership are the type of people who go to the North Pole America. Yeah. Okay, Richard, well, look, my view is that we should proceed in Belfast, uh, and I think it is the most cost-effective and most realistic alternative available to you. Yeah. Got to drive on and get a situation where we get finality, mm -hmm. and that's the trick at the moment. That sounds good to me. I've never seen a council respond so fast. <laughs> Farouk Bajwa and his assistant Sarah have been preparing their case against the policy exchange. But there's been an unexplained and worrying development for the mosque. Their opponents have applied to the court to get the entire case struck out on the grounds that the mosque can't legally sue them. If the charity had registered itself as a company, a not-for-profit company, as well as a charity, no problem of legal status. The fact they didn't choose to become a company means that in legal terms they're what's called an unincorporated association. This is complicated, so they're seeking advice from Adrienne Page, the QC, who will represent the mosque in court. The defendants are trying to knock the case out on what one might call a legal technicality. It raises a point of law about whether or not a charity can bring a defamation claim if it's not a limited company. And if they are right in what they're arguing, then the claim could be knocked out. So it's a bit of a sideshow, but it's, it's a sideshow which could be terminal for the case. Very well, good, good. to see you. Yeah. Hi, Richard. Morning, hi. How are you? Hi. Morning. OK, we're working away on the skeleton argument. Um, fairly immersed in obscure areas like um, history of trade unions being able to sue or not able to sue, <laughs> partnerships, unincorporated associations and so on. Um, and it is actually, it's a jolly difficult point. I mean, there, we, there, there's absolutely no direct authority that we've found. In other words, it's something I strongly believe there's a lacuna in the law and that it ought to be remedied. Um, but I, I don't feel able to be over positive that we're going to succeed. And that's the problem we face, that I think they can contest this on the basis that, that it's, it's the moment it's unsupported. It's a completely grey area. Because obviously it's not something they want to go to trial. No. no. And so if they can try to on a technicality. No. I think we do think that they're probably challenging the whole concept. Yes. Yeah. I think they're most likely to do that. I and mean, this is a chance for them to get rid of the whole claim. So I think yeah, they're going to oppose us yes. on every possible. They're going to lose. They, they, yeah. they will, yeah, they'll throw every obstacle in our way. So Mr. Cosby and Mr. Sawala are fully aware that the other side's application is a strike out on the basis yes. of the fact that the claim was wrongly brought. They're quite determined to carry on. They want to carry on. Fine, fair enough. So their instructions yeah. are to carry on. Yes. Mr. Cosbar says that whether it was connected or not, he doesn't know, but they even had an arson attack, they had hate mail. Um, it may be very difficult to relate it to the policy exchange report, but um, they, this could be a response to the policy exchange report, directly or indirectly. Um, they need to be able to vindicate. Four days later, and it's the first court hearing to decide if the mosque's libel action is going to be thrown out. Let's have okay. a look at their skeleton. Let's have a look at this. It's the application and lacks the requisite legal personality. And it's interesting that they put that last. That's there. That is their critical yeah. sentence yeah. there. The policy exchange, in my view, are determined to avoid going to court on the main issue, namely, the actual trial on what they wrote. They're not wanting to go to court to defend their report now. So what they're dying to do is to kill this case by some legal means. But the stance taken by policy exchange is one most defendants would adopt no. and doesn't reflect the strength of their case. It's in the balance today. So I would be lying if I said we weren't slightly nervous about this. Salam alaikum, brother. <laughs> How are you, brother? Good to see you. Hello. You Hello. Black coffee. Where's mine? That's your chocolate. 
what about the, That's the, the barristers? Case. I mean, is she, is she confident that we can convince the, the judge? I'll be honest, I think initially she was a little bit worried that we wouldn't be able to convince the judge. But now as time's gone on and she's seen more and more cases, now she's increasingly confident that the judge will recognize that it will be a huge injustice not to allow this case to go ahead. Right. Okay. There's actually no case like this before. We're making legal history today. Really? Mm. I don't know how that makes you feel, but the North London Central Mosque Trust is actually making legal history. But history isn't made today. The legal argument is complex. Eventually the court adjourns and the only decision the judge makes is that both parties have to return in a couple of weeks to argue their points again. This is bad news for the trustees. They want to protect the reputation of the mosque. They want to protect the charity. So if this came for some reason is struck out, Mr. Cosba asked Adrian at the end, that what do we do? What is our recourse to justice as a mosque? We are being defamed, the mosque is being defamed. What do we do? And to which Adrian said that's exactly the point that she was going to try to make today and will make at the next hearing. There has to be some recourse available to them. Paul Tweed oh. is in Belfast meeting his opposite number from Forbes. It's been three years since the article was published and Forbes still maintains it is not defamatory. A trial seems inevitable. The question is, where? Paul Tweed wants Belfast, the cheapest option. That would simplify matters in one sense. And I obviously haven't flagged it up to him, but my client hasn't got the funds. He's expended his money in the States, simple as that. And we're putting all our chips down into Belfast. Today, they both argue the point in front of a Belfast judge. My view on all this is, you know, my client's happy to put his lot in the ring with a Belfast jury. We can try and move for an early hearing and see what we can do. There's a lot in for them as well, because for the very same reason that I want to minimise my client's cost exposure in the light of his current financial position, they obviously want to try and minimise their risk. Having heard their arguments, the judge says yes to a trial in Belfast. Do you any idea at the moment as to what dates are available, if any? I mean, are we still looking at uh, June at the moment? The key thing for me is to get an early hearing date. And he's dragging his heels in that, and I'm going to have a lot of difficulty trying to force him in, because I'm going to try and get a date. The minute a, a date becomes free, we, were, we are immediately going to go into the court to see if we can persuade the court to consider listing the case for a date in February or March. So it'll be a, a long battle. Even February or March will be almost four years since the case began. At the outset, if I said, oh, I'd be going through this whole big process of losing the money, basically, to try and rectify things, it being dragged out for years, the time that goes into it, you might say, no, maybe I shouldn't do that. But I want the truth to come out, and I do want to be compensated for what they've done. The mosque trustees are back in the High Court two weeks after the adjournment. Their opponent, the Policy Exchange, claims that under current law the mosque is not allowed to bring a libel action. Arguing that legal point has already led to a day in court and costs of £50,000. As a result, the trustees hope that this action will not take more than a day. but by night time, it's still unresolved. Back at the mosque, the main trustee is disappointed. He knows how much is at stake. Abu Qadir, Yahya, Muhammad Yassin, Zakaria Dahir, Isa, and Farth, 
It's about maintaining the trust and support of the local community. Adam, how many times have I told you? Come in. Before, there were, there were no children coming here to the, to the mosque, actually, because of the problems. I mean, people were maybe scared to bring their children to the mosque. Everyone plays each other once. We're going to start now. We've worked hard here in that mosque to retain it to the Muslim communities, to the wider communities, and to imagine before the 2005, how was the situation here. Boys, 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 stop, come over here, listen. It is an important issue for all, as I said, it's not just only for the mosque, it's for the whole Muslim community, because we all offended by this report, we all offended by this report. But for Mr. Kozbar in the mosque, the second day is no better than the first. Adrienne Page, our counsel, started speaking this morning, outlining our case. Uh, she carried on all day, and she still hasn't finished. So we're going to be in court at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Perhaps I'm still biased, but I don't think the odds have changed. I'm still confident 55-45 in our favor. But on day three, the judge delivers a devastating verdict for the mosque. The case is thrown out with no right to appeal. They also have to pay the costs for the hearing of seventy-five thousand pounds. It was a, it was a terrible it was a terrible day to be honest. It was very disappointing and obviously a terrible shock to us and our clients. When the judge commenced judgment, no one was kind of prepared. For and that. in essence, what he said was that the case before me is I'm asked to decide whether. The North London Central Mosque Trust has sufficient legal personality to be defamed. And he said, my conclusion is, no, it doesn't. Interestingly enough, I think that um, our leading counsel discovered that Oxfam... Was an unincorporated... Unincorporated association. So if Oxfam had been defamed, um, they could not, as a charity, bring a claim, which is just, it sounds ridiculous. It strikes us as, as being yeah. unfair, and it really strikes us as being a breach of natural justice. What else Absolutely. can a charity do? Having lost the case, the trustees have a heavy price to pay. This is the unfortunate thing from our client's point of view. There are now six trustees who are liable for all the costs of the policy exchange to date. Their costs are definitely going to be above 100,000. There's no uh, doubt about it. Quite probably double. Double, yes. Definitely. And the tragedy of it is, is that we haven't even got round to the argument over the defamation. Tweed has heard it could be another year before Richard gets his day in court. But in preparation, he's asked Richard to put a figure on the damage to his business in the last three years since the article was published. Yeah, I'm actually in Belfast at the moment. Yeah, something to do with uh, the court case against Forbes. As Richard's gone over his accounts, he's realised that the number of participants has halved since the article. Hey, Richard. How are you keeping? So his lost it's revenue is far higher than either Paul or he had anticipated. Yeah, We're sort of maybe talking about a, a net figure of somewhere in the region of 350,000. Can we sort of talk through how you've come to that? Where I've come up with uh, is based on 2006 figures. There's a loss of at least 70 people since that year. Now I'm not filling those seats. If you're subjected to vigorous cross-examination, which you will be in the event that this case goes into court. I mean, you're happy that you can stand firm in those figures? Absolutely. Just before the Forbes article was written, I had 54 competitors in the race. Uh, this year, it's now three years later, 2009, and there was 31 new competitors in the race this year. OK. They've got to hit your credibility, basically, to make any inroads in defamation litigation. Everything. So much depends mm -hmm. on how you perform in the box. So much. That's why I've been going over these figures. It's so important mm -hmm. that they are credible. I mean, we're now going into this case, and it looks like we're going to be claiming a very substantial six-figure sum on top of the damages we'll be seeking for the injury to your reputation. I know that, and I'm yeah. sure it's trying to... Nearly three years pursuing this claim against Forbes has taken its toll. Libel is becoming like a chronic illness. It's always there in the background hanging over me. It's something that wears you down, it wears down your family members. Hi, Carolyn. Just finished the meeting with Paul. If the case goes into court, it won't happen until uh, June. And that's what it looks like. My wife was saying before I came, you know, I wish this was over. Because it's constantly in the back of your mind, you know. 
that these allegations are there that you have to defend. The mosque trustees have lost their case and personally face legal costs of around £100,000 between them. It's not fair to, to lose such a case when people uh, speak about you or wrote about you in, in that way and you cannot defend yourself. The community is left frustrated by how the law has treated them. The court has not looked at what has happened. They have just looked, can we accept the case or we cannot accept the case? I would like people to appreciate the work we've done um, during the last five years in the mosque. If they don't want to appreciate, I would rather ask them not to interfere. There's been a lot of debate within the Muslim community about how to tackle issues which affect the Muslim community. You get the really extreme end, which are those who resort to violence, and then you get the other end, people who want to work with the system and try to change it peacefully and properly from within. We hope it really encourages future organisations of all faiths to take legal recourse. I mean, surely this is what the British government would prefer, legal action rather than rioting or violence. I mean, surely this is the right way for Muslim organisations to behave. The last throw of the dice for the trustees is to ask another judge to review the previous decision and grant them permission to challenge it in the Court of Appeal. We hope that the judge will listen to us, and, uh, not just only for our charity, for any charities in the future that want to take action. Some good news, finally. We were granted permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And so uh, the fight back starts here. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I think the first insurers have a big incentive. The trustees go straight to their QC's chambers to discuss the next step. We're, we're back in business, basically. Back in business, yes. I'm about to say it's a close shave, but realise close shaves are not something you specialise in. <laughs> <laughs> but despite today's verdict, Adrienne Page is urging a cautious approach. First of all, do you go ahead with the appeal? Can you, as individuals, afford to take the risk that you will fail and you'll have an order for costs against you? You know, we might be talking about... What? I think between 60 and 100 is my guess. 60 to 100, For, for yes. that one day. <laughs> one day. Yeah. It's going to be very because expensive. it's not just the one day, it will be all the work that they have to do for that six to eight months mm. leading up to it. Which is, we have to prepare the case, prepare the bundles. I want to steer them towards appreciating that libel can rebound and that libel is uncertain, that libel is expensive and that courts aren't the best way to resolve a lot of these things. If you lose the appeal, yeah. um, not only you have to pay them, but you've got no negotiating yes, yes, starts. Yes. The mere fact of getting permission, it gives us a window of opportunity to go back to the other side and see whether they will negotiate in, in the hope of reaching a settlement. I think both sides would probably be more amenable to a settlement now yes. than perhaps they were at the original stage of the mediation. Yeah. I mean, this has been going on for so long. It, is still a long road left, is still risk uncertainty. There are all these legal traps, and what they need to know is there are other ways of achieving a good outcome short of litigating to the bitter end. It's almost a year since Richard told Paul the loss to his business was £350,000. For their part, Forbes magazine, in the defence document that they have just sent, say the article gives an accurate picture and in any case was written in a playful style. I wouldn't have anticipated such a lengthy document. I mean, it's uh, 18 pages, which is uh, long for a defence. They're standing by their allegation that the airline was unsafe, inappropriate, it was dodgy, 
there were problems, you know, there was luggage stacked at this, safety exits. You were basically uh, putting your charges at risk by mm. uh, transporting them in this manner. And then on the other hand, they're saying, look, we're only joking, this was only a light-hearted yeah. piece. Nobody could possibly have taken this seriously. Well, I, to me, it's not a magazine known for parody. On the one hand, they're saying it's a joke. It was self-evidently ironic. At the same time, after the fact that they wrote it, they're now trying to prove that it could be true. Yeah. You know? yeah. I think and that, they had, you know, it's a bizarre approach yeah. to me. I think the defense is worse than the article. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I would disagree with you. Not, uh, and I actually found the defense more annoying than the actual article was. The, the gloves came off and I got angry and I started contacting people because I had to knock each of their points. Paul Tweed now has to build his case in preparation for the trial. Okay, Tom, thanks for coming in to see us uh, today. Uh, He's taking witness statements from runners and journalists who are on the same flight. One of the allegations that has been made in the article was that there was luggage stacked up at the safety doors. Was that something that you were aware of? It wasn't anything that I saw, and there were a couple of times when I moved around the plane to go up to the cockpit to film. Mm. But as far as you can recall, the actual safety exit... I didn't see anything blocking any obstruction. I don't recall there being any exits blocked. Uh, would you be the sort of person who would check? For the you know, I am the kind of person yeah. that always listens to the yeah. safety announcement yeah. and <laughs> watches where the exits are. Everything worked. The um, aisle was clear. There wasn't rubbish anywhere. And you felt comfortable and secure in the flight? Would that be fair or would that be putting it too um, I wouldn't have gone there six times if I'd... Yeah. Uh... No. OK, thank you. The suggestion in the piece was that uh, this was a very dangerous plane. If you read the article, you'd have to ask yourself, would a person be put off by going to the, to the race after reading the article? And the answer is yes. The nature of the race itself... This is going to be the battle now and it's going to be us going on the attack trying to get to a situation where we have got them in a corner. The mosque trustees have now won the right to take their case back to the Court of Appeal. They want to keep fighting, but their lawyers know if they lose, the trustees will face legal fees in the region of £600,000. The difficulty for our clients is that as a charity, and a relatively small charity, the expense is huge. Um, it could have huge implications on their life. Massive. I mean, they could be bankrupt, their houses um, be forced to be sold. So Farouk has negotiated a compromise settlement with the policy exchange to present to the trustees. It's not ideal, it falls short of an apology, but it's a clarification. We have to kind of push settlements to our clients. We have to. Ah, yeah, that's how an hour. Good to see you. Are you well? Right. But Farouk is unsure if the trustees will accept the compromise. Yes, about a few months ago. OK, brother, just to let you know where we are yeah. and what's happening. We've had a lot of negotiation. So they've offered um, some sort of a clarification. But considering what the report said, Mm. And considering what their attitude has been to date, this is quite a major change for them. It says, in our report, The Hijacking of British Islam, published in October 2007, we stated that the North London Central Mosque was one of the mosques where extremist literature was found. Policy exchanges never sought to suggest the literature cited in the report was sold or distributed at the mosque with the knowledge or consent of the mosque trustees or staff. We are happy to set the record straight. Clear on the, it has to be clear on the, the statement absolves the trustees and staff, but the policy exchange has not apologised either to the mosque or the trustees. Obviously, this is not the one which we want in terms of, of, of the wording, but, I mean, dramatic changes happened here at the, at the mosque. Now, the other major part of any settlement is obviously the costs. Their original cost schedule was absolutely horrendous. I mean, it came to £453,577, wow. excluding, excluding that. Of that. Okay. So we have stuck to our position of 20. And amazingly, they've come back and said that if you pay us 20, um, this case can be closed. Okay. For them, is, is, is It's is, a big clump down. Yeah. And they've agreed to put this on their main website. Yeah. 
And I think the message that the public will get is that there was a report. There were clearly inaccuracies. Anybody who looks at it will, will know immediately that there's been some legal action. Yes. And they've had to do this because of the legal action. If this is the best which we, we, can, we can achieve at the moment, uh, taking into consideration what's, what, what we went through during the last few, few months, th this, this is the best option for us at the moment. Th therefore, we decided to, to accept it. After months of expensive wrangling over a legal technicality, the trustees never had the chance to test in court the evidence underpinning this report, and the policy exchange has not conceded it was flawed. It is not what we looked for. We tried from the beginning to have a full apology. Um, yes, we didn't, we didn't get what we want, but I think we had, uh, in the end of the day, we had to compromise on this issue. And it is acceptable uh, for us uh, taking into consideration what we went through for the last uh, couple of years. In Richard Donovan's case, a trial is looking likely in two months' time. But his lawyer, Paul Tweed, is unsure about the risk involved. He has negotiated an offer from Forbes and wants Richard to consider settlement. He's shown tremendous guts and determination in taking the case this far and taking on a mighty and very wealthy worldwide publisher. But I can't take risks on his behalf. If he said to me, Paul, money is no object. If I lose this case, I'm going to go down half a million, maybe three quarters of a million. If the case runs for three weeks, you have two sets of legal costs, uh, two counsel on either side. If he told me that's not a problem, I wouldn't be having this settlement conversation now, but that is a problem. OK, Richard, uh, good to see you again. There has been uh, quite a bit of toing and froing between myself and the lawyer acting for Forbes. You're not going to get a formal apology, but I'm pleased to say to you that, you know, we are in a position where we've got a six-figure sum on the table now. I've managed to negotiate an all-in figure, £140,000. That includes, say, the damages, costs, all the expenses you have done. They will undertake to remove the offending yes. material from their website. And the deal is that the case will be withdrawn from the list. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got a six-figure apology. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, in my view, money speaks louder than words. Yeah. Well, are you happy for me to finalise settlement along the lines that we've discussed? Yeah, I think so. With all of those terms, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to, to finish this and move on. Yeah. You've taken on a major... Mm -hmm. international publisher, probably one of the, mo the wealthiest publishers in the world here. I would imagine. <laughs> and, you have, yeah, and you have brought, you know, you have brought them to heel, mm -hmm. effectively, here. Mm -hmm. Although Forbes did not apologise or admit liability, Paul and Richard are happy. I think it is a first-class vindication for him. You know, he said at the beginning they were wrong, and he's established by getting 140,000, beyond any doubt, that they were totally and absolutely wrong. For me, the message is, these guys took on my reputation. You know, your reputation is the most important thing you can live with, and it's important to fight for that, and um, I would encourage anyone to do so. Forbes' view is that this was an example of libel tourism and a strategic attempt to deprive an American publisher of its constitutional rights. Richard Donovan withdrew his New York suit and pursued litigation in jurisdictions where Forbes has few readers and where free speech protections fail to satisfy US standards. Love me, love my face, a remarkable story of one man's courage next. <laughs>